All right, well, this is the first time in several years that I've been able to be here for the entirety of Mises U. It is my favorite week of the year. Joe just said it was his favorite week of the year. It's the best week you can imagine. Bob Murphy and I have even coined, or Bob coined an expression, post-Mises U depression. That's what you get <laughs> at the barbecue on Saturday, unless you win one of the cash prizes, in which case you're in quite cheerful spirits. At dinner tonight, I was asking people how they came to find out about Mises University. I myself found out about it in a very, very old-fashioned way. I saw it advertised in a print magazine. So, you know, obviously I'm an oldster. I read a print magazine and I found out about Mises University. So I had several people tell me that they are students of Professor Per Bieland, who is... Uh, who has been a uh, fellow here and has done a lot of work with the Mises Institute. And I found myself saying, you know, it might be nice to have Pear on the faculty someday. And then it occurred to me, well, maybe the reason Pear isn't here is that Peter Klein really covers his area. Peter's really the, uh, the expert in that area. So I'm not saying we want, uh, uh, you know, an unfortunate accident to occur with, with Peter, but, but if it did, <laughs> we'd have the, you know, benefit of hearing from Pear Bieland, he's nodding at me. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if that morbid joke is going to work, but all right, he approves of it. Okay. All right, today I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I mean, look, I, I don't really want to do this, to be honest with you. Like, when, I think you came here so that you could avoid having to talk about the election, but I'm afraid I am here to throw cold water in your faces. Yes, this is really happening. I do what they tell me to do. They want to talk about the election, doggone it, that's what I'll do. But I'm going to give it, uh, my, my remarks will have a bit of an Austrian spin, as you might expect tonight. And I'll start by th making the observation that you probably will hear this week and no doubt have read if you have done the, the, uh, the readings. And that is that uh, Austrian economics is described as being value-free. What that means is that as a science, Austrian economics is not telling you what ought to be done. It does not say, sometimes people will say, what's the Austrian position on minimum wage laws? Or what's the Austrian position on the government budget? Well, there is no Austrian position per se. The Austrians have a lot to say about the likely consequences of a minimum wage, but as Austrians, they don't say the minimum wage should be X or there should be no minimum wage. But you can draw certain conclusions certainly from what Austrian economics tells you. And as a human being, you can reach certain uh, positive, uh, or I beg your pardon, uh, normative conclusions. However, I gave a talk here several years ago, it was the opening talk, in which I said that you can in fact derive some useful insights from the positive statements of the Austrian school that if they don't quite compel you to certain moral conclusions, they come pretty darn close. And it seems to me that all you need to do is study Austrian economics and then insert the fairly non-controversial proposition that human welfare is a good thing. And Austrian economics plus human welfare is a good thing does draw you some conclusions. But there are other conclusions as well that we can draw. And the, for these, I begin with the following. If you were to read Murray Rothbard's book, Man, Economy, and State, how many of you have read that book? OK, great. How many of you are lying about that just now when you raise your hand? <laughs> OK, all right, good. Now, if you read Man, Economy, and State, which, by the way, there, there's controversy about whether you should read Man, Economy, and State before or after human action, I'm a beforeist. I've been a beforeist for a long time, but just because I think of the layout and it's, it's the vocabulary and in some ways the elegant simplicity of the presentation, I would go with Rothbard first. Uh, some, some week we'll have a debate between the beforeists and the afterists, but I'm telling you, I'm right on this. Read Rothbard first, and then you read Mises. It doesn't seem so bad. But when you read Man, Economy, and State, what kind of a picture is painted for you in that book? The picture that's painted is an elegant structure. The, the picture that Rothbard paints, for example, in his chapters on production theory is a picture of an extraordinary latticework of, of exchange and prices and buying and selling and interest rates that all works together harmoniously to produce the tremendous array of goods and services we see around us. 
And we see that there are higher and lower order stages of production. You've no doubt read about this so far. And the production between, the interaction between these stages is coordinated. But there's no person who's in charge of all the stages ordering anybody around. And yet, interest rates and prices and you, the utility that people derive from the finished consumer goods, all these things are working together to yield you this tremendous structure of production that just operates on its own. It does not need central direction. Moreover, where do these prices of the, what we, we call the higher order goods come from? A lot of times people will say, the price of your toothbrush or your new hat or your steak dinner, these things come from their costs of production. Well, that's not what we believe, so if, if, if you were writing that down, cross that out, because we, we believe the op we, opposite of that. Where, where in fact, do, where do these so-called costs of production, where do they come from? Because simply to say, well, this good, we can explain its price by, its co by the cost of production. Well, where do those costs come from? Blank out. Where do the costs come from? Well, it turns out that we believe in a reverse imputation when we talk about factor pricing. That is to say... First, you have the consumer who wants things and who, has, who, who gains value from certain things. And the consumer who desires some particular good or a whole array of goods is, without realizing it, helping to determine the prices of the factors of production that will go into producing that consumer good. And we can understand this point probably most easily if we think in terms of, and this is right out of uh, Menger's principles, we think of a capital good that can produce only one consumer good. And then let's say the demand for that consumer good drops to zero. Like everybody becomes convinced that it's poison and they don't consume it anymore. Demand drops completely. There's no more demand. But so that we see that correspondingly the same thing would happen for that capital good. Because that capital good can only produce this one thing that nobody wants. Nobody wants the capital good either. So its zero is imputed from the directly and very clearly and obviously from the consumer goods zero. But again, note that this is all happening without anybody setting prices or, or giving people questionnaires or running surveys or asking people about the intensity with which they desire certain things. None of that. This all just happens. Uh, we could say the same about interest rates, which coordinate production across time and reflect the social rate of time preference, which will be talked about a great deal this week. And these, again, occur spontaneously, as do prices themselves, which occur in the ordinary process of buying and selling. Likewise, money itself emerges on its own. This is one of the important points in Mises' book, uh, The Theory of Money and Credit. Uh, 1912. In that book, Mises is trying to respond to what we might call the state theory of money, by which money emerges by some kind of state fiat. But it was Mises' contention that money does not in fact emerge in that way and cannot emerge in that way, and rather emerges within the voluntary sector of society. It emerges little by little. When you're in the condition of barter, People realize that the condition of barter is unsatisfactory. No doubt you've heard this line of argument. People find that unsatisfactory. They find that they can achieve their ends more effectively if they settle upon some kind of more generally marketable good that people, uh, have, uh, people like. And then people begin to want to acquire this good not because of any direct use they can uh, acquire from it, but rather because of its value to them in exchange. They can use it to get the things that they want. And so little by little, you get a, a general medium of exchange that is in use throughout the society, and that is known as money. The point here is that money, according to uh, the Misesians, is itself, again, a spontaneous production of peaceful society. It is not the result of coercion, violence. All these things are occurring spontaneously. Even profits, now, of course, profits first require prices. But profits, the profit and loss system, that system is the system by which we make sure that the scarce resources in society are directed toward their most value productive ends. And entrepreneurs can use profit and loss to decide what 
processes of production ought to be continued or discontinued, or maybe there should be some different uh, type of production process substituted for another one because this one is too expensive and the inputs are more heavily demanded elsewhere. It's because of the profit and loss system that these calculations become possible. And these calculations are essential to human well-being because when you consider the virtually infinite array of possible input combinations, and the vast majority of these are completely ludicrous from the point of view of, of economy and economizing, well, we see the importance of profits. Now note, when we think about all this, money, prices, interest rates, the structure of production, and so on, what do they all have in common? They emerge on their own. There is no coercion involved. There is no need for leadership of any kind. These things occur naturally. And this is what I mean when I say that when we look at Austrian economics, even though it does not burst from the page telling us here is an extra economic conclusion that you can draw, nevertheless, it seems to me that it is a very valuable thing to realize that what Rothbard is saying and what Mises is saying is that these essential ingredients of civilized life do not require politics. I think that's a very, very important insight. And it is at no time more important than in an election year. Because in an election year, we are badgered constantly by people who tell us that politics is indispensable to our lives. Oh my goodness gracious, we get political convention speeches, we get yard signs, we get inane slogans, you get your next door neighbor who never shuts up about stupid nonsense he doesn't even understand, and it just goes on and on and on. And now it's gotten to the point where three months after the election, they're already talking about, well, who do you think is going to run in 2020? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can I have no peace whatsoever? So I want to note the contrast here. Anytime I hear the word leadership, what we need is great leadership, or we need somebody who knows how to govern. Oh my gosh, especially coming from conservatives. They're the worst with this. I expect that from the left. Of course, the left are totalitarians. They want to run your life and throw you in a concentration camp. I expect that. <laughs> but with the right, for these people to talk about, we need somebody who's ready to govern. What does that mean? What does that mean? Why do you feel so inadequate about your own life that you can't accomplish anything unless somebody is governing or telling you what to do or shouting through a bullhorn or exerting leadership? Why don't you just do something productive for once and shut up about leadership? Pat told me there'd be a, a bottle of water for me in case <laughs> things should heat up. There are about 10 of them down here. <laughs> oh, we're just getting going, baby. Now, look, I don't want to mention any real names. I have no choice. I guess I have to. I have to mention some names. So, for example, let's talk, you know, let's, why not? Let's start with the Republicans. Why not? Republicans are fun to talk about. Uh... Now, by the way, let's point out, remember what you're going to hear, the fundamental thing you're going to hear over and over and over again, over and over and over and over again, from now until you drop dead, if you keep hanging around with us. It's that exchanges occur in the market only when both parties expect to benefit. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry I had to repeat that. I know you've already heard that. But compare that with politics. Nothing happens in politics that both parties consent to, or they wouldn't have had to do it politically. They could have done it on the market. Oh, good. I'm getting an amen from back there. That's good. <laughs> So bear, bear that in mind, okay? So in other words, there is a, an a priori moral reason that we should want to favor uh, market activity as opposed to political, which always involves grabbing from some and giving to others or disabling some and enabling others. All right, so we're talking about the Republicans. Well, all right, the Republican nominee, I know we know it's Donald Trump, so I'll just say it. I watched the acceptance speech that he gave, and... It was a long speech. I, I actually, I was thinking to myself, this must be the longest speech I've ever heard. And it turns out it was the longest. It turns out it was the longest. But what I found interesting was that it was almost as an afterthought that taxation and regulation were mentioned as bad things. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that 
if we seize your stuff and, you know, smack you around a bit, that may also be disrupting production. Yes, yes, that's the thing. Why, uh, why was that, why did we get 75 seconds of that and 75 minutes of something else? But to me, they, I think these kind of are sort of important, important issues. The key, one of the key aspects of the speech seemed to be that if we get inexpensive goods, this is a bad thing. And I'm, you know, I, I, again, this is another thing that everybody brings up, but it, it's brought up all the time because it's so darn good. And that is, if you haven't read it, you've got to read the Frederick Bastiat Petition of the Candlemakers. Now, I almost want to say how many people haven't read that, but who's going to raise his hand for that? Oh, I, I haven't read it. <laughs> I don't want to put people on the spot like that, but just, just know that I have a funny feeling which ones in here haven't. So get to it, all right? It's great. The Petition of the Candlemakers, of course, is satirical. And in there, you have these candle makers who are petitioning the government for relief because they're saying, look, there's this terrible competitor out there we can't, who's totally unfair in his competition. How can we possibly compete with this guy? We're producing light for people. You know how important that is. Where would you be without light, for heaven's sake? And meanwhile, we got this totally unfair competitor who's dumping light on the people <laughs> for free, and you may know him as the sun. So we propose that people be required to shutter up their windows and keep out this awful, unwanted gift of nature so that they can instead buy candles to light their homes. Now, when it's put that way, you say, well, that would be stupid to expend resources on something that's being given away, you know, for free. So why would we do that? But in some way, that is what every protectionist argument boils down to, every single one. They all boil down to that at some level. Oh my goodness, protect us from the fact that now people's incomes can stretch a lot farther to buy a lot more of the things that they want. I want their incomes not to stretch as much. And by the way, as somebody with five children, I can tell you that it is a good thing that you can get, uh, you know, like a to toddler pajamas for five or six bucks now. Instead of 30 bucks, you know, we used to be ripped off in the past, and now I'm supposed to be saying, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, I so wish I could get ripped off when I buy baby pajamas, but unfortunately, I have to get a bargain. <laughs> why would I think that way? And why would I want to sign a petition? Yep, you know, you're darn right. It would make us better if we imposed a sales tax on baby pajamas. Then we would be richer. That can't be. That can't be. We would not be richer if the government takes more money away from us. That makes us poorer. If I have fewer choices than I had before, if I have fewer choices than I had before, that makes me poorer. Now, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of more, a lot more things that can be said in the free trade debate, uh, certainly. I had Bob and Vox Day on my podcast uh, not too long ago, and they had a debate on, on free trade, and I want to continue that uh, as soon as Bob becomes available sometime in the year 2021. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get back to that. But at least, I mean, these are some basic thoughts. In other words, the point here is that the argument really is that government is not really the problem. The problem is that consumers have been spending their money in, in ways that we would rather that they not spend it. So that's the kind of message that's been sent. Now, Ben Shapiro is a conservative writer I don't much care for. The other day, he's all up in arms, oh my heavens, Donald Trump is destroying the Republican Party because now, look, we have a party where the nominee barely even mentions the Constitution. He doesn't mention conservatism. He doesn't really talk about the free market. And so what, what Ben prefers, apparently, is a party where they talk about the Constitution all the time. They talk about the free market all the time. They talk about conservatism all the time. And then they spend all their time violating the Constitution and screwing the free market. That, that's what he likes. So he'd rather they talk a whole lot about it and then do nothing, as opposed to somebody who's at least honest that he's not going to do anything, man. I, you know, I slightly prefer the honesty, if you ask me. You know, I mean, in a way, it's like what Malcolm X said about the 1964 election. He says he prefers Goldwater, because at least Goldwater is up front with him, whereas uh, Lyndon Johnson is obviously a snake who's never going to tell you the truth. So, all right, well, I'll take that. All right, and then the, the basic message is we need different people in charge because the other people in charge haven't done it right. Okay, but maybe the problem is the it that they're doing. Maybe we don't need people doing this it to, to start with. And in particular, if I need people doing that it, they would not be Newt Gingrich, Chris Christie, or Rudy Giuliani. 
They wouldn't. Those would not be the first people I would think of for anything, except world's most annoying people. <laughs> Although I will say, Chris Christie taking down Marco Rubio, I can forgive a lot for somebody who could do that. I can forgive a lot. All right, let's talk about um, the other person in the, the other major party. Let's say a little something about Hillary Clinton. I actually don't, I have no idea what she's even saying in her speeches because I don't watch them. I don't watch them. I'm sure you have not watched a Hillary Clinton speech. Um, and I'd love to say I sat down and watched one for you, but, you know, the Mises Institute couldn't possibly pay me enough to do that. <laughs> so I went to her website. Oh, I went to her website. <laughs> yeah. We have this filtering software so the kids don't do anything bad on the Internet. And this is going to come up in the reports. You know, you went to the HillaryClinton.com website. And I'll have to say, no, that wasn't the kids. That was me. I, I, I went to the Hillary Clinton website. So I just thought, all right, let's just see what she's saying, what she's talking about. Now, the thing is, you have to bear in mind, you can't always assume that what they say they're going to do is what they're going to do. I mean, to some extent, she's probably just trying to get some of the Bernie Sanders voters. But on the other hand, don't ever forget Horton's Law. Horton's Law, you know, please write this down, it's from 1840. I made that up. It's from like 2016. <laughs> it's my friend Scott Horton, who comes on my show a lot. Horton's Law is that, and, and I defy you to find an exception to Horton's Law, apodictically true. It is that when a politician makes promises, you can be certain he will keep all the bad ones and forget about all the good ones. Okay, so when Hillary Clinton promises she's going to do these things, I pretty much take her word for it. Okay, so for example, she wants to raise the minimum wage. Now we're all tired of hearing about the minimum wage; it's been argued to death, right? Not me. I could talk about it forever, but I mean, most people, they're tired of hearing about it. And because we we have been on the defensive a little bit, we opponents of the minimum wage, because the argument has been, don't you know about all the empirical studies that have shown that the minimum wage doesn't cause job losses? All right. Well, Bob knows all the literature on that. You can badger him the rest of the week about that. I've had him on to talk about it. And just one of the zillion points you can make is that when you're talking to these people who want to raise the minimum wage to $15, that's a more than 100% increase. None of these studies they're citing have, had, were dealing with anything like a 100% increase in the minimum wage. None. So, so none of them even apply to this whole fight for 15 thing. Now, I, I don't know that Hillary Clinton has come out expressly for fight for 15. What I do know is I saw a Facebook meme. This is where I get a lot of my news, by the way. <laughs> I saw a Facebook meme with a young woman holding a, a megaphone outside of McDonald's. And the quotation beneath her reads as follows. I've worked at McDonald's for eight years and never gotten a raise. That's why I fight for 15. All right, now let's, we're going to take that apart. <laughs> Here is my translation of that. You ready? I've worked at an entry-level job for eight years. <laughs> and haven't gotten a raise. Also, during that eight years, I haven't been able to find a single solitary employer willing to pay me one dime more. So you'd think I'd at least appreciate the one place on earth willing to employ me. But instead, I'm shouting through this bullhorn. I'm gonna continue, oh, good. <laughs> The person continues, a raise is a human right, therefore I am calling in the goons who will hold a gun to my employer's head until I get paid $15 an hour, an amount not a single solitary person anywhere on earth has ever been willing to pay me voluntarily. That's why I fight for 15 That's what that really means. And when you think of it that way, it's suddenly you think, eh, something kind of fishy about this. Okay. Now, with the minimum wage thing, you can go through and talk about how few people actually earn the minimum wage, how unusual it is to be earning the minimum wage for longer than a year, much less eight years at McDonald's, and you've had eight years to look for alternative kinds of employment. Eight years? And you live in the age of Udemy, where you can learn an online skill in like a week, and you find nothing? All right, now I'm just riffing. I got to stop this. All right, so we got the, she wants to raise the minimum wage. 
Okay, now, the minimum wage point was amplified, I think, with an, with an additional excellent argument in May at the Mises Institute event in Seattle by good old Walter, who says, look, on the one hand, they tell us we've got to send money to all these poor countries. But on the other, why don't we just tell those countries, hey, just raise your minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. I, I put a meme with that on it up on my Facebook page. It got almost half a million views because people were sharing that thing like crazy because they realized, yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, if it were that easy, we would just, yes, that's right. And in fact, when you look at the entire Clinton program, it's all, we want more of this, we want more of that, we want more of that. And so it just suffices to keep demanding and demanding and demanding more of the private sector. So the private sector gets ever narrower and narrower. The demands begin to flower. The base supporting all these demands gets ever narrower and narrower and narrower. That's, that's it. I mean, that's the, that is where statism takes you. All right, then she says, labor unions are essential to a free society. Oh my gosh, is she ringing a bell for a train that's gone 50 years ago? I mean, I don't know if you ring a bell for trains, but it sounded good. <laughs> I mean, labor unions are dead and gone. They are dead and gone except in the public sector. But they're dead and gone, because you know, you're either going to have international trade or you're going to have labor unions. Uh, you're either going to have affordable goods or you're going to have labor unions. L now, look, I can say this as somebody whose father was a teamster for 15 years. So I guess a Marxist would say I have suffering from false consciousness because I'm supposed to support the labor unions because my father was in one. A, a pure Marxist, of course, has no patience for labor unions. But the labor union is one of these phantom, phantoms of the textbook that is sort of expected to bear a tremendous amount of explanatory power when it comes to explaining, for example, why the American standard of living has been so high in the 20th century, why it must be because of labor unions. The trouble with this is, and I have a little bit, I think I have a little bit on this in my 33 questions book. That, that book has such a terrible title, I'm not even going to tell you the title. It's so terrible. Just type 33 questions in Woods and you'll find it. But in there, I talk a little bit about this. And it turns out that in the 19, uh, let's see, well, through, through the whole 20th century, the whole history of the 20th century, labor unions never got to up to more than about a third of the labor force was, was unionized. So it, it's a little hard to explain rising wages when only at most a third, and that was only at its peak of these people were in fact uh, unionized. But by the 1920s, the, the, uh, if you look at the United States versus Europe, Europe was much more heavily unionized than the US, and yet American wages were higher. Americans were able to get uh, lower hours uh, that they wanted sooner than Europeans were. So there are some uh, factors here. But we think about what exactly happens with a labor union. Uh, uh, you have to think about, here you have, there, there are two parties in the textbook version of the labor union. There's the employer, and there are union workers. Now, there's a third party that's being left out. Isn't that the truth of all of life, right? The third party being left out. So you have the two parties, the employer and the employee, the, the union employee. But I'm going to show you about this third group, because the third group kind of is the key to the whole thing, as it turns out. The labor union workers are not knocking on the door and saying, Dear Mr. Employer, sir, uh, we've humbly assembled a petition of signatures because we believe that uh, conditions and wages ought to be improved. Instead, what happens, or certainly what happened in, in much of the 20th century when labor unions were, were uh, more powerful, was that violence would be used and destruction would take place. And if you wanted to go in and say, well, you know, I will accept the terms being offered by this employer, well, you would be beaten up, uh, kicked in the head. Uh, we have cases, uh, high profile, late 19th century cases where non-union workers' homes were actually blown up with dynamite. Um, so that part of the story generally doesn't show up in your, in your textbook. They talk about, you learn, you memorize the name Samuel Gompers, and you write down American Federation of Labor, but you don't learn about people having their limbs blown off, or brickbats being hurled at people, or broken glass, because then the story isn't quite as much fun to tell. So that's just out. So what in fact does happen? Through intimidation of one form or another, and the comp well, let's, let's, let's face it, I mean, the, the state is conniving at this, 
because the state's police will not intervene to stop what's going on. So they get the employer to raise the wage. But what does that mean? What do we know about economics, right? They're going to raise the wage. They're going to hire fewer people. That's what the union wants. They, they want to exclude. They want their people employed and to heck with everybody else. And the everybody else turns out to be that third party I was referring to. What happens to those people? Well, those people are dehumanized because they're called scabs. You know, scab is like the nice word for them. These people are scabs. And they're even referred to when your textbook will deign to mention them, sometimes use the term scabs. And you would think they would think that was kind of a dehumanizing word to use to refer to working people. But these working people are to be despised and ridiculed and dismissed. So where do these people go? Well, now they have to, maybe they're just locked out of that industry. They got to go somewhere else. And now here's the, here's the key point. First, we have the inefficiency involved that naturally we need the, we should be having more people working in this industry, but we don't. But a lot of these people were trained to work in that industry, and now they've been shut out. Because for labor unions to be able to keep the wage that high, they got to exclude people. They got to create an artificial scarcity. So where do the excess go? They go down a level. They go to a level of, of employment that's less desirable. So you see, when we follow the non-union people, we see, wait a minute, there's another side to this story. So not only are these people in less desirable employment, but now there's a lot of people there pushing wage rates down. But secondly, those people now don't get to use the skills that they train to learn because they've been excluded from the industry that they belong in. So all that training was a waste. So there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of deadweight losses, not to mention the union rules that are in effect that are basically meant to make work as inefficient as possible. Like there'll be a guy who, you know, let's say you've got a lecture hall and that lecture hall is unionized. So if, if you need to turn the cassette tape over in the old days of cassette tapes, you'd have to wait, get the union guy to come in and he would turn the cassette tape over and then leave. I mean, it would bizarre, multiply that by 50,000. That's what you're dealing with, with the union work rules. So it turns out this is not good. This is not actually good. That the way wages rise is the opposite of this. Wages rose in the U.S. despite the fact that the U.S. was very, very little unionized compared to other countries. Wages rise because profits are invested in capital goods, which mean that you can be more physically productive in your economy, and the greater physical production puts downward pressure on prices, and then the workers' uh, check, um, paycheck can go farther. That's what does it. Again, it just happens. It happens through the natural orderly development of society and the economy. You don't, you don't actually need the goons, it turns out. Isn't that great? You'd think people would be happy about this. Society can be run without the initiation of violence. You'd think people would be happy about this. And then when you try to tell them, it's like you're telling them, we're going to rip the hearts out of cats just for fun. <laughs> you, you would think people would be delighted to hear this. I didn't realize we could run society this way. And you know, the funny thing is they're not. They're not delighted that way. Oh, but my favorite Clinton policy, oh, my favorite, even though it's not front and center, it's my favorite because it, we're so right on this, and she is so wrong, and yet we make no progress whatsoever. And for some reason, <laughs> something about that just gets to me. So it's the, it's the gender pay gap. You know, I've lost track of lost track of which one of these bottles I'm drinking in. So I think, I think what I'll do is I'll just take one swig out of each of the 10. <laughs> so that, <laughs> all right. The gender, we all know this, right? Men earn more than women. And what, and that is true. In the aggregate, men earn more than women. Then we get this leap. And now this was Bernie Sanders believed this. Hillary Clinton believes this. Ev Ivanka Trump apparently believes this too. <laughs> and, and the thing is, the, th the funny thing is, she got the basic insight as to why it's there. And she said it in the speech and didn't even, didn't penetrate. Wait, wait a minute, maybe that's why there's a gap. I'll get to that in a minute. I'll tell you where the gap is with some of these people. All right. All right, so it's, a, it's, it's that men earn more than women. And then they draw this, they, they take this leap and they say, men earn more than women and women earn less than men do for doing the same work. Now, that, now, wait a minute. That is not the same thing. To say women earn less than men is not the same thing as saying women earn less than men for doing the same work. That's, that was dealt with in the Equal Pay Act of 1963. That's, that's already covered. 
So what, what are they talking about? So they're looking in the aggregate. They say, well, here, here's the big pile of money earned by men. Here's a pile of money earned by women. The women pile is smaller, so something sinister is going on. All right, well, I am now going to tell you the real truth of what's going on. And here's what I love about that. Well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to keep the punchline a secret just for one more second. Here's a fact about the, the gender pay gap that's going to lead into my punchline. It turns out that these jerks who promote this thing are not even bothering to measure the simple issue of number of hours worked by men and women. Now you think, oh no, surely, Woods, they must be factoring in that men work more hours than women. They are not. <laughs> Here's in fact what they're doing. They're saying, oh, we are, we are factoring that in because we're only comparing full-time workers. Yeah, okay. Here's the old full-time worker sleight of hand. Well, look, baby, you know, I'm, uh, I'm like Penn and Teller up here when it comes to that kind of sleight of hand, okay? It turns out that the, the, the Labor Department thinks of full-time work as 35-plus hours a week. All right. So anybody working at least 35 hours is considered full-time. But, you know, some people work 40. So how many hours are men and women working? That's the question. How many hours are full-time men working versus full-time women? Because as long as they're 35 and over, it's considered full-time. Well, it turns out 12% of women are working just between 35 and 39 hours. Only 5% of men work so few hours. Well, how many men and women are working 40-plus hours? 26% of men work 40-plus hours. 14% of women work 40 plus hours. Well, when you factor that in, the pay gap goes down from 23 cents on the dollar to 12, with just that one adjustment for honesty. <laughs> now, the punchline. Guess which prominent institution in American society also has a 12 percentage point wage gap? The Obama White House. Oh, how about that? So they asked poor Jay Carney, Jay, you guys are going to go around persecuting. Well, they probably didn't start it this way. That's how I would have started the question. <laughs> you guys are going to go around persecuting private businesses for having a 12% pay gap. And you guys have a 12% pay gap between men and women. How do you account for that? Answer? Well, you see, men and women have different jobs here in the White House. Do you think a private employer would be allowed to give that particular answer? But of course, that's the whole thing, right? So for instance, it's not enough to say, boy, you know, it seems like Asian PhDs earn more than black PhDs, so there must be a pro-Asian, anti-black bias. Well, how about asking, what are the PhDs in? If you are getting, now it turns out that more than half of black PhDs are in education. This is a very low-paying field. We all know that. But the Asian PhDs tend to be in chemistry, uh, engineering, etc. So when you look at that, you say, oh, well, okay, of course that makes sense. Don't compare apples and oranges. Well, likewise, the experiences of men and women are like apples and oranges because in the case of women, they have the possibility of childbirth, which will interrupt your career for an extended period of time. So there are some career choices that will be less appealing to women because it'll be harder to jump back in. If you're out of the workforce for five years, there are some fields where your knowledge will be, if not obsolete, then very, very much out of date. And those things are ruled out. Whereas on the other hand, if you're caring for children, you're more likely to think that the more flexible and school-friendly schedules of, for example, a school teacher or a secretary are appealing. So it's not like women are drawn to these fields by some kind of a giant magnet. It's because they work with the, the life circumstances that they find themselves in. And so Ivanka Trump actually, she said that. She said, you know, and, and you know, mothers have a particularly difficult time in this regard. But this is why, it's because they're mothers, it's not because there's anything sinister going on, because all you have to do is look at never married women and never married men. And there is essentially no pay gap there. How about that? So, uh, you know, eh, there it is. All right, so now you know. There's no pay gap. There's a whole lot of crap. Don't believe it, okay? 
All right, how about the Federal Reserve? What do you think Hillary thinks about the Federal Reserve? I, I'm not even going to dignify that with an answer, okay? We're not even going to cover what Hillary thinks about the Federal Reserve. I refuse to sully this podium in that way. I will tell you that there have been times when I've thought that Trump had his finger on this, that he would say that the Fed is pumping up financial bubbles. And I'd say that is great that somebody in public life is saying that. And then on the other hand, he'll say, I think the Fed should continue its low interest rate policy. Oh, but you see, those are the same thing, right? <laughs> the same thing. All right. So I'm done with the Fed. But how about, can you believe on her website, you'll never guess, income inequality is on there. Now, I mean, you could make jokes about her speaking fees and blah, 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 and all that. I'm not going to go that route because, you know, I'd be thrilled if I had that speaking fee. No. What we're going to talk about instead is the, you know, a few relevant considerations on the subject of income inequality. Now, I have a little bit on this. Um, I put together a little ebook on Bernie Sanders because he was, his people on Facebook were driving me crazy, and I thought, ah. Oh, yeah, I remember when we Ron Paul people used to do that to people on Facebook, but that was different because we were right and they're wrong. But <laughs> So anyway, I put together a, uh, Tom DiLorenzo has an essay in it, uh, Bob Murphy has an essay in it, a few other people here have essays in it, and I just thought, let's just be blunt. I call this ebook Bernie Sanders is Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so now that Bernie is kind of off the stage, um, my free ebook is having a fire sale. <laughs> so... If you, if you want it, th these arguments are probably going to come up again. I have a funny feeling. Uh, all you have to do is text to the number 33444. Just dial 33444 and text the name Bernie, and I send you that book. Well, not me, of course, some robot somewhere. Yay for our robot overlords. Okay. <laughs> So texting Bernie to 33444, get to that book. But even though you're going to get that book, don't read it right now because I'm going to tell you what's in it, okay? So don't read it right now. Read it later. But on the, on the income inequality thing, we could talk about statistics. That's true. I could sit here and tell you that over the course of their lives, 56% of Americans at one time or another are in the top 10% of income earners in the U.S. Now, I dare say that is more mobility than we had in, you know, European history, let's say 300 years ago, 500 years ago, ever, probably, right? Very, very unlikely that a serf really rose that high or almost anybody, right? So that's just, that's just one fact. How about when you look at these studies that actually trace actual people? Usually you have studies that look at the bottom 20% here and the bottom 20% here, but they're different people. They're not different people. Joe Schmo, who was in the bottom 20% in 1996, Joe's in another one in 2005. That's the study I want to follow. Where did Joe go? What happened to Joe? The bottom 20%, they actually did a study. Bottom 20% in the decade 1996, 2005. But by the end of that decade, the bottom 20%, their incomes had nearly doubled. And the top income group saw their incomes fall by 26%. Now, that's not what we usually hear. No, it's not, but that's the truth. Um, and there, there I, I had, a, again, I, Bob and I on Contra Krugman podcast, we did a whole episode on income inequality, so you can find that. Uh, it's uh, ContraKrugman.com. Anyway, you can also look at just overall conditions of the poor because, you know, Rothbard used to have this example, you know, he would say that eventually only a lunatic would care about income inequality. If it turned out that I have seven yachts and you have only five and you're still complaining, there's something the matter with you, okay? Just quit it. Enjoy your yachts and live out your happy life. So it is, it is worthwhile just to think about the absolute standard of how the poor are living. So the bottom 10% in the least capitalistic countries are earning something like barely $1,000 a year. Whereas in the most capitalistic countries, and this, you know, it's hard to measure this, but you can kind of figure it out, the bottom 10% are earning about $11,000 a year. You know, that's 11-time difference. That's something, right? That's the point. And it turns out, by the way, there's actually, if you measure income inequality using the Gini coefficient, there is less inequality in the most economically free countries than there, there is in the, in the least economically free uh, I got a whole bunch of these, but but you know what? To heck with them, because you can you can read them, you can find them, you can listen to the podcast. To me, what matters really is the
the overall improvement in the standard of living. It's been so extraordinary that the fact that you could sit up and say, well, that guy's getting richer just a little bit too fast for my taste. It's just, <laughs> it's just a lack of gratitude on a scale I can hardly imagine. So I'm going to give you this example. I got this from Deirdre McCloskey, who says that in Burgundy, as recently as the 1840s, if you look at the men who worked in the vineyards, after the crop was in, in the autumn, they would go to bed and stay sleeping. They would, in effect, hibernate, all huddled up together to preserve their warmth during the winter because they could not afford the heat and they could not afford the food they'd have to consume if they got up and expended energy. That's the real human face of what we're talking about. That's gone, basically, for all intents and purposes. That's what we're talking about. These people now have luxuries people could not even have imagined. Could not even have imagined. In fact, sometimes when you watch The Twilight Zone and you look at what they consider to be futuristic, it's so clunky and stupid, you're laughing at them. They couldn't even have imagined what we have now. And you know, there are people who scoff at that and they say, oh, material things. <laughs> Tell that to those people. You know, I, I think, or, you know, money can't buy you happiness. I bet it could have bought those people a little bit of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. If you're telling me it doesn't buy happiness, then you go to Burgundy and sleep through the winter, you jerk. I'm sorry. I just, I'm in the middle of moving and I am in a foul mood, people. <laughs> Around 1800, the world income in modern terms was about $3 a day. And I mean, that's like $3 in your wallet right now. And you have to imagine how you would divide that up among all your needs. And then think, how could you live a life of spiritual and intellectual fulfillment under those conditions? If you were lucky to survive at all, are you going to be able to go join a local book club? Are you going to become an expert chess player? How is that possible? In that, that's a miserable existence. Don't tell me material things don't matter. That is a miserable existence. Now, that number is $33 a day, even when you include the most backward countries. And by backward countries, of course, I mean backward governments. $33 a day, an 11-fold increase. Wouldn't you think an 11-fold increase, the likes of which we've never seen, and by the way, in the major industrialized countries, it's more like $100 a day, and now you think to yourself, yeah, I could, if, I, if, if the chips were down, I could survive on $33 a day. I could. I could survive on $100 a day. Plenty of people do. With that kind of unprecedented change, the fact that you could even think about income inequality just boggles my mind. Now, yes, I know. If the super rich people got that way because of the Fed or the government, then yeah, that's right. Take it all away. I agree. You're right. The point is, be happy with what you have, you know? I mean, who's that, uh, who's that singer who she used to be married to that... Uh, steroid bicycle guy. I can't. Cheryl, Crow. Cheryl Crow. Doesn't she have a song where she says you gotta want what you have or some kind of thing like that? Something like that. I don't know. I don't listen to your, I don't listen to your young, youngster music. Actually, that's already oldster music now, isn't it? Yeah. That's when you know it's time to wrap up. Well, the Marxists say that the market pits classes against each other. But obviously the state pits classes against each other. In the market, we have all these voluntary interactions, and on the, in the state, we have coercion and hangmen and everything else that, that Mises described. The International Division of Labor is the greatest assembly of human cooperation ever seen in history. Now, what are we up against, we who believe that society seems to just work? It can just work. All the major ingredients just work. Well, let's see. We're only up against the whole world, by my reckoning. We're up against the politicians who exist in order to contradict us on this point. We're up against the media. We're up against the, the, the media and the, the movies, which can find all kinds of private sector villains, but never a government villain unless he's a sort of free market guy. But then they, even then, they never quite get the free market guy right. Like on that show Family Ties in the 80s. Alex Keaton was supposed to be the conservative, and he's got a portrait of Nixon by his bed. They, they, they don't even get what a, a young Republican would. But at least I knew young Republicans. None of them had a Nixon. I mean, they, they were not good for other reasons, but they, at least they were better than that. 
you're up against this, the schools that exist to say, hey, where would you be without all the political, you know, without the political class? So we are very much the underdog. But you know what? People love the underdog, and the underdog surprises you once in a while. And among underdogs, the Institute has been an underdog. The Institute does not have billionaire donors. It's not located in Washington, D.C., thank heavens. It does not get, uh, you know, in invitations from government officials, nor does it extend any. And yet, it goes to show that if you quietly and diligently do your work and stay faithful, things happen. Now, my advice to you this week is to work and pay attention. You'll be tempted to check your email, check your Twitter feed, and I'm begging you not to do that. Get your questions answered in person by this faculty. This is a lot of fun this week, no question about it. But we're also doing something very serious here. We're training the next generation of dissident intellectuals, people who will communicate and build upon these great ideas. So let your efforts be worthy of the great tradition of scholarship represented here. You know, whenever I hear the expression children, the children are our future, for some reason that sends a chill up my spine. I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> but if those of you in this room are our future, well, then we can look forward to it with confidence. Thank you.